Sometimes you have a time of need or necessity and you are at a loss to explain it. You've searched your heart. You've asked God to help you and give you wisdom to understand. You've done everything you can and you cannot trace it to any of those things. What's going on in that case? Well, you could be, well, I don't think any of us would qualify as a Job, but there are circumstances like Job where God lays something upon your life for a divine purpose that's hidden in his own heart. Job was never told why God did what he did. I think we can study the book of Job and we can discern some things God was doing in Job's life We can discern that God was using him as a perfect and beautiful illustration of Christ, the innocent, suffering for the guilty. We can see the gospel played out in the shadows of Job's tragedy, but Job probably never saw it, or if he did, he never said so. Sometimes things like that can be going on in your life, and you perhaps will never in this lifetime be able to say, Oh, now I get it. But what you can do is what Job did, is you can humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and you can say that which is right concerning Him. Even though you don't have a specific sin to point to and repent of, you can just repent on the general principle that you are a lowly, sinful creature, in the hands of a pure and holy God. You can just humble yourself like that and trust God will turn your captivity like he did Job's. So sometimes it's a case like that. We, there is no human explanation for it. And you might not discern or you might not know what's going on until you get to heaven and all of a sudden you'll say, wow, you did that through that time? Thank you. That's what you accomplished with that? Now here's another case. Uh, By the way, I should mention, when that is the case, it is almost always temporary. It's not an ongoing, continuous, continuous thing. It comes, has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Usually. God might put you through a time of necessity in order for him to show his own strength, to show that he is strong. Remember, his strength is made perfect in your weakness. As we'll see when we study riches, many verses talk about how riches are part of what makes a man strong. Well, sometimes you become, if you're not careful, almost arrogant in your confidence in that strength. And so God will break that in order to remind you that it's His strength, not yours. God will show you that while He delights to use your resources, He'd rather use you. Amen? And he would, he, that's what he wants to do. He wants to use you in the ministry of, of uh, his, his use of you and your resources. He wants to use you. It's you that he's interested in. Amen? Not your money. He gave that to you for a reason. He wants you to use it and all that kind of stuff, but it's you that he's interested in. And sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's possible to forget that. Now, God's purpose could be, then, to show forth His strength somehow, to remind you where the strength is. His purpose might be to keep you from evil. Yeah, remember the prayer in Proverbs 38-9, to Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Who can pray that? Give me neither poverty nor riches. We can all pray, give me neither poverty. Poverty. But most of us say, lay the riches on me, Lord. I'll use them for you. But this prayer was, give me neither 
poverty nor riches. Why? Lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. So in principle, I can deduce from this the idea that God does, I believe, sometimes put us through times of necessity in order that he might protect us from some evil that we might do, some corruption that might develop in our life if he did give us riches. You know, it takes a pretty good character to handle riches properly. It's something we'll look at when we study the issue of riches. It takes a pretty solid character to handle that. Because it does give you a certain amount of power and freedom to do things and to service the flesh that other people just don't have. Now you might have certain weaknesses in your flesh that are such that if you were rich, you would be a mess. And God might have blessed you with restraint and constraint in this area. You might get to heaven and be able to say, Wow, Father, I'm really glad you didn't make me rich because I would have been a mess. So that could be a reason that God puts you through a time of necessity. Perhaps he's preparing you for riches. But you've got to pass through a time of necessity to be prepared for it. As some, that, which is something that develops a little more right now. It can have the purpose of teaching you important spiritual lessons. Remember, Paul said in Philippians 4 verse 11, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And he goes on to talk about how he's learned to be content when he's abased, and he's learned how to be content when he abounds. There are some interesting proverbs that we'll look at later that talk about how miserable rich people can be. Always worried, always afraid they're going to lose something, can't sleep at night, worried about how their riches are doing. It, it can, it, you can really you know, come under the tyranny of your riches if you're not careful. You've got to learn how to be content when you abound, and how to be content when you are abased. You've got to learn to face both of those with the same basic spiritual mindset. I live for the glory of Christ and not for my own glory. That has to be your mindset. So that when you are in a time of abasement, you trust God will use it to His glory. When you're in a time of abounding, you trust God will use it to His glory. And You don't go, Oh, boy, I'm something. Oh, my, I'm nothing. Oh, I'm something. Oh, my, I'm nothing. Who you are doesn't ride with whether you abound or are abased. It's important to understand that. If you're walking spiritually and you're walking in the Lord and you're doing His will, your dignity and your honor doesn't ride with abounding or abasing. It just stays at contentment. There are a lot of discontented rich people. And there are a lot of discontented poor people. It's just as much a sin to be discontentedly rich as it is to be discontentedly poor. And I should say it's just as much a sin to be discontentedly poor as it would be to be discontentedly rich. God would have us to learn contentment. And sometimes he might put you through a period of abasement and leave you there until you just relax and become content. Now many of us would like to be put in the position of riches and God to leave us there until we become content. God is wise all those tricks. Don't try it. 
So God would also have us to learn not to trust in uncertain riches. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they, may, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Now that verse comes up again in our subset of messages on the issue of being rich and how to deal with that, and what all that's about. But consider it in this light. God would have you to know not to trust in uncertain riches. Not only does God want you to be able to remain content, whether abounding or abased, God also wants you to trust God just as much when you're abounding as you do when you're in abasement. Or the basement. Amen? Some of you might find it easy to trust God when you're abounding, but have a terrible time trusting God when you're in a basement. And yet for others, it can be exactly the reverse. Some people find it much easier spiritually to trust and depend on God when they are a base than they do when they're abounding. You might find you're one of those persons that when you start abounding, you start straying. And God has to bring you to a basement to draw you back. One of the reasons God allows us to go through times of necessity is because He wants to teach us to be content, whether abounding or being abased. He wants us to learn to trust Him as much when we're in the basement as when we're on the mountaintop. Or as much on the mountaintop as when we're in the basement. We must learn to trust the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding. And one of the subtle deceitfulness of riches is this, the vain imagination that because I'm rich, therefore I'm smart. And I know the right way to do everything. No, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. He shall direct thy paths. Amen? So it's an opportunity also to embrace the cross, to identify with Christ who made himself poor for us. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, that he who was rich made himself poor for us that we might be rich. And so sometimes we go through times of necessity Again, not when they're related to laziness or lack of judgment. Remember the caveat here. I'm not talking about that kind of root of poverty. But these times when you go through things, and that isn't the reason. You're just going through a providentially prepared time of restraint and constraints financially. You're passing through. It's tough. It's difficult. These are some of the things God is probably doing. Maybe even more than one of them all at the same time. God's like that. 